Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that introduction. And uh, so in case I forget anything, I think she uh, caught the main points. Um, so yeah, I'm from Norway, from the west coast of Norway, a little town uh, in a global scale called Bergen, but it's the second largest city. And uh, Norway has just about the same population as uh, Slovakia. Um, and I started studying there back in 2006, and I started studying sociology. And in sociology, one of the main areas of focus is power. And I became interested in the relationship between the majority and the minority, so the power relationship between various groups. And more specifically, I started to look at the relationship between the Norwegian majority and the Muslim minority. And as many of you probably know, there's been a large influx of Muslim immigrants to Western Europe in the last couple of decades. And uh, several people had studied so how Muslims perceived life and uh, how they experienced, for instance, discrimination. But very few people had looked at the people who were negative and hostile to Islam and Muslim immigration. So that's what I start, uh, started to do. And I decided to conduct interviews with what you can call anti-Islamic activists. And it quickly struck me uh, in conversations, you know, private conversations with friends, but also with other academics. Uh, and they would, they would approach me and they would say, for instance, you know, aren't you scared? Um, and uh, are you sure you really want to talk with these people? And that kind of thing. And it struck me that uh, they had more or less as unnuanced views of these guys, these anti-Islamic groups, as the, uh, the groups themselves had of Islam and of Muslims. And I just started thinking back then, I remember, you know, how easy it is to fall into these black and white categories, to see things in black and white, and you know, good guys and bad guys, whereas in reality, it really isn't like that, at least not most of the time. And instead of helping you, this black and white configuration of the world clouds your thinking. And then, uh, as was mentioned, back in 2011, terror struck Norway. And here you have the government quarters. So uh, the Norwegian terrorist Anders Bering Breivik, a 30-year-old man from Norway, first attacked the government quarters, he bombed it, with a huge uh, bomb. And then he, uh, disguised as a police officer, uh, infiltrated a youth camp uh, for uh, basically kids for the Labour Party uh, at the island of Utøya, a very idyllic, uh, nice little place. And also that day, a death trap. So he came there and uh, uh, concealed himself as a police officer and they led him uh, onto the island, and he started to hunt people down, consistently shooting them, and it was a massacre. And it was just a completely horrific, terrible event, um, and with no precedent, I would say, in this case, uh, in Scandinavia at least, and uh, uh, it was just uh, a major shock to a small country with very little experience of political violence, and also one of the world's lowest murder rates. And this unleashed a lot of debate, a lot of anguish, but also a very strong sense of togetherness. So I don't know how much of this uh, you watched, for instance, uh, was covered on your television, or, but um, <clears throat> uh, one, of, one of the manifestations of this sense of togetherness were the rose marches, where you had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people walked into the streets uh, uh, showing their support and sympathy for the victims, but also for the ideals that the terrorists wanted to attack, of openness and freedom and democracy. And here you have a picture from my hometown of Bergen, as I mentioned. And I participated in, in uh, this rose march. And it was uh, extremely moving, of course, a very, a very strong, powerful, and emotional moment. Uh, but just before uh, the terrorist committed his attacks, he also released a manifesto detailing his ideas. And then I wound up in the very peculiar situation as back then a master student 
uh, being one of the very few who had some sort of in-depth knowledge about this universe of ideas that he seemed to share. So together with a professor in criminology, we decided to go through this manifesto, a huge like a tome of 15, some 1,500 pages of all his ideas and thoughts. And here you have the title and um, the number up here, 2083, alludes back to the year of 1683 when the Turks, the Muslim Turks, uh, laid siege to Vienna, which is something of a mythical moment for these anti-Islamic activists and also the more extreme versions such as, such as Bayevik. And we uh, compared it point by point to the rhetoric of these anti-Islamic activists. And we argue that uh, the language uh, and ideas of the larger anti-Islamic movement inspired but also gave direction to the terror attacks, meaning who he decided to go for who he wanted to kill. <clears throat> now, these anti-Islamic groups and this social movement, as we can call it, is by and large very peaceful. So this is completely opposite to Bayevik, of course. And where you can kind of, uh, if you unravel it a little bit, you can see that even though they are peaceful and promote democratic solutions, they used a very uh, aggressive language. Several metaphors of, of war uh, turned up again and again and again, and they also had these very apocalyptic scenarios. You know, Western civilization is going down the drain, uh, being destroyed by this multicultural, cultural Marxist elite, and the Muslims will, uh, will uh, Europe will eventually turn into uh, what they call Eurabia. Uh, and so he took these, these ideas and these metaphors of war, which I guess most of us also sometimes use, you know, uh, and it's very common. But he took these metaphors of war and this apocalyptic scenario and he turned it into solutions, meaning violence. <clears throat> and as I was doing this work, I, rem I mentioned just now that it was very emotional uh, for, and traumatic for everybody. But as I was doing this work, I realized that I became more and more distanced, you know, emotionally. And this, of course, was because, well, I was analyzing it. But as I was doing this, I remember when the trial started on television. And maybe probably some of you uh, saw parts of it as well because it was broadcast live. And I remember, remember turning on, and then suddenly it all hit me like a wall of emotions. You know, here I am sitting and analyzing the thoughts of a mass murderer, rationally, like going through them, without really, you know, absorbing, taking into account the tremendous amount of suffering and pain that he unleashed on so many people, the victims, friends, and relatives. And for me, and I think this is something that probably many of you can recognize in your own lives, uh, it was really tough to balance my professional role and my academic role, so work, and my more uh, emotional side, my private side. And uh, I often felt like I was walking on a tightrope. I don't know if you understand that metaphor, you know. Um, but. At the same time, as, as we were doing this work, and then I had this reflection, uh, you could also see a lot of a debate was unleashed all over Europe. People started talking about extremism, and people started, started labeling various groups, ideas, and also individuals as extremists. And I think it's a very, yeah, it's a very natural reaction. Uh, but it's also a problem in and of itself, because it maintains and it creates these black and white images, and uh, it fuels antagonism, so hostilities. So I believe that we shouldn't dismiss, not at all, we shouldn't dismiss discrimination, extremism, and uh, political violence. Of course not. But neither should we exaggerate it. And it is, it's easy to fall into that other end, you know. And because then that clouds our thinking. And so at the same time as, so when we were doing this work, 
and uh, trying to balance on this tightrope, so to speak, between all these various aspects, you know, the individual, the private, our roles as academics, and the whole political debate, ongoing debate, you know, and how this had affected so many people. Uh, we were, of course, analyzing the ideas of the terrorists, as I said. And that means that we listened to his story, the story that he wanted to tell, and the story that he wanted to spread. And in many ways, you can see the terror attacks, and he also said this himself, as a publicity stunt. He only wanted to get his uh, thoughts and ideas out there, and he used violence to do so. And that is, of course, what terrorists do. And this started to trouble us, that more or less we and everybody else only looked at this, at his story, in so many ways. And so we decided to look at the, the terror attacks with new eyes, and we got in touch with uh, a couple of Finnish criminologists from Finland, uh, who had been doing work on uh, school shootings and other kinds of violence, and then we looked at not his story, not his speech, but his actions, and, his, and the story that his life told. And point after point, it become, becomes painfully and obviously clear that he has just as much in common with school shooters as any kind of terrorist group. And this is, of course, something that he doesn't, this inspiration is something that, that he doesn't want us to think about or to see, because then that disrupts his vision and his ideas. And as we were doing this, you know, it hit me again and again, and as I was mentioning, that dealing with extremism and political violence truly is like walking on a tightrope, you know. And in order to, first of all, understand it, and secondly, if you ever want to try to stop it or com combat it, you have to really investigate reality to escape from these narrow black and white boxes and delve into reality. And it, it's, it's a difficult process. And I think just this, the attempt of escaping these boxes that we make for ourselves is probably something that many of you can uh, also recognize. And it's a, it's a truly difficult process. And so how does this carry over for you? And many of you don't work directly with extremism, but many of you try to influence other people and their thoughts. Perhaps you try to foster a more understanding and open society, as I know many of the other speakers here talked about in their work. And so my advice is basically, it's quite banal, it's quite simple really, but it's also very profound, and that is to think of the consequences. You know, think of the long-term consequences of what you're doing. And because oftentimes, if you're involved in some kind of way in a political struggle, which I also came to understand that many of you are, indirectly or directly, so even if you're not involved directly in politics, you're involved in a political struggle about ideas, about what is good and just in life, and so forth. And then you, many of you act on that. But you are often met with a choice. And uh, that is to either marginalize the opposition, those you are opposed to, try to push them away, push them away really, or to include them, to try to co-opt them and engage with them. And you know, that's sometimes I realize that's not possible. When people step over the line and become activists and radicals and terrorists, it's really difficult. But I think that this is something that uh, is worth dwelling on. Um, and that also means that sometimes we have to swallow some really bitter pills, you know. These might be people that you really dislike and you abhor their ideas, but it might be better to opt for inclusion and then in the long term avoid larger problems. And of course, in real life, 
we oftentimes we don't we will never know if the one approach or the other really works so that is a fact of life but still i think it is worth dwelling on and um yeah that's it for me and this presentation and i'm looking forward to seeing many of you later in the more in-depth discussion we're going to have on extremism and ways specific ways of combating it thank you